Um, yeah, good to see you and, and good to uh, have this conversation. It's uh, obviously one of my favorite topics. Uh, it's clearly one of your favorite topics. You have wrote how many books so far on the on the topic, including the child's book that I have to get my hands on. So uh, yes. Um, so I want to say I think six books on water, uh, one children's book on water, and we have a second children's book coming out on oh. oceans. So awesome. yeah, I, I love this children's book thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it too. I have to get my hands on one of those, but uh, you can go and, and, and take a look at Will's publications on, on Amazon. They are very interesting and also provide a lot of context. But uh, now we have uh, Will with us and we wanted to do um, to use Will's experience to, to travel through the journey of the water stewardship space. So Will has been around for quite a long time. I don't want to say in a very long time, but let's say it's quite a long time. <laughs> he has been around since the inception of the of most of the water stewardship conversation. And I think he can provide us an interesting uh, opportunity um, to, to travel to three stations that I, I want to cover in this conversation. And the, the first one is um, the past. So uh, I wanted to to, to get a, a, some, some of the information from your will around how the, the water stewardship pay got started. How was the water stewardship conversation 10 years ago when, when things were just rolling? Can, can you give me a, an overview of what, how it, was the space before it, it got hot? Like, no. I, sure, I, I, I feel like the, the elder historian here, um, but but that's okay. I, you know, I embrace it. Um, so, I'm going to take it back a little bit further in time. And uh, part of this will be my personal perspective uh, on the journey. And I actually believe corporate engagement on water is a, a critical issue began uh, a number of decades ago when the environmental movement started. And in the U.S., uh, we had a couple of very significant uh, regulations that showed up, federal regulations. One was CERCLA, otherwise known as Superfund, and RECRA. And that's when the corporate world really began to get engaged on environmental matters in general, and I would say water in particular. So you had events such as uh, Love Canal, uh, Woburn, Massachusetts, major Superfund sites that really... Uh, drew the attention of the general public on water as a critical health issue. And that, I believe, was was really the, the beginning of water stewardship, uh, even though then it was primarily a compliance issue, a regulatory-driven issue. What happened, I want to say a couple of decades ago, was really the shift to thinking about what's beyond compliance. And that's when water stewardship began to emerge as uh, really a, a, a key corporate strategy. And water stewardship was really born out of, uh, you know, many corporations, including, I, I would say, Coca-Cola, uh, kind of leading the pack, that water was a business risk. Uh, it had to do with social license to operate, obviously a critical ingredient and resource uh, for a number of industries, but in particular, consumer-facing uh, uh, industries, CPG sector, and food and beverage. So you, you saw the emergence of water stewardship as a uh, term of art describing how a corporation would begin to think about water uh, as a business risk and how to mitigate the risk. And you know, as I said, Coca-Cola led with their replenish strategy, which was uh, a framework that continues on today, although it's, you know, been evolving over time for a number of reasons. Uh, and then you saw NGOs such as WWF, uh, the CEO of Water Mandate, emerge, really beginning to develop frameworks for thinking about what is the corporate journey in understanding water as a risk and how to build a uh, campaign around 
quantifying risk, mitigating the risk, communicating the risk, uh, and mitigation uh, initiatives. And, uh, you know, a lot happened in the past couple of decades going from water as a regulatory issue, mostly on, on water quality, to water stewardship. And, uh, you know, certainly some of the things that you've been involved with uh, are at the center of that. And at and, and, and the beginning, most of the water conversation was very much focused first, as you mentioned, the regulatory part that I, I believe we, luckily we, we have some like bad stories there, but overall we are past that and now we're focusing mm -hmm. on, on bigger topics. So when we moved from that, it went more around a social responsibility issue, much more tied to wash, to, it, to it, act. It, 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 yeah, it, it, that's a really good point. Um, you know, so in the early days of sustainability at large and water stewardship fits into that, um, uh, you know, initiatives and, and uh, corporate focus, it was corporate social responsibility. It was the triple bottom line, you know, coined by John Elkington, um, uh, you know, and then it, it part of it morphed into ESG reporting, but uh yeah, it, it was very much a you know corporate view of sustainability at large, and then water as a piece of that puzzle, um, and uh, and and then it matured over time. And I'd say that you know water stewardship is a, a fairly mature concept mm -hmm. uh, at this point, even though there are no shortage of companies that are just beginning the journey and trying to figure out what's an appropriate corporate water stewardship strategy for them and their industry sector and, and who they are as an organization. And 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 there are, you, you mentioned some key word that is the word risk, yeah, and how risk started to be. Mm -hmm. It was much more clear for beverage companies to understand that water is an right. ingredient, it's not a neutral thing that's happening outside of us, but it's, a, it's an ingredient. So where you saw the world risk and that risk tied to a monetary value start to pick up in, in the space and in the conversation. Right. So, you know, the way corporations view water as a risk is, is across three dimensions, physical, regulatory, and reputational. Mm -hmm. And physical is pretty straightforward and probably the easiest to quantify, uh, understand. And, and that has to do with quantity and quality of water. So does a company have enough water uh, at this moment in time and going forward five plus years to run their operations? So it gets into business continuity. Uh, do they have the right quality for their business now and going into the future? On the regulatory side, it is what are the regulations right now and what might they be going forward? And how do they manage a shifting a regulatory framework with respect to water so they have business continuity and business growth. Uh, one thing I would add on the regulatory side is that historically it's been about quality. So, you know, quality of water in, quality of water out. Now it's included, now it's um, quality rather. Uh, now the quantity dimension has been added to it because of water stress and water scarcity. So a company might only have a certain allocation of water to run their business, which drives technology innovation. And then reputational risk, it's, you know, essentially anyone with a social media account can comment on how you're managing water, uh, good or bad. Uh, and that has the potential to shut down a company, period. And it's the most challenging to understand. Um, so, you know, that's how companies think about water risk. And there are tools out there, public tools that are available. Uh, one thing I would add is that from my perspective, the important part of this is what is the business value at risk? Quantifying business value. And the easy way to look at it is how much revenue am I generating at each location in my network and in my supply chain and what's the risk to that revenue generation and then there's also the brand piece of the puzzle which is you know uh, 
reputational risk, uh, damage to your brand, uh, and the flip side being, can I uh, initiate a program where I am viewed in a positive way by stakeholders to create brand value? Okay. Uh, and, and they are moving on into the present. Do you see a much more broader understanding of, of um, value at risk? Uh, uh, and and why value at risk risk unlocks investments in the space? I, uh, that's what I believe, and and I think it, that you probably do that value at risk unlock investment. Why is that connection? It, it, yeah. So uh, business value at risk, you know, I believe we believe is is really critical in the scheme of things. Quantifying that mm -hmm. because water is grossly undervalued, so the the price of water is very low. And, you know, I often say, and I'm often challenged on this, that water is essentially free. So if it's free, then it's difficult for a corporation to uh, make an investment in water technologies to reduce their water use, you know, essentially drive efficiency, uh, reuse, recycling, and, and so on. So if you not uh, you know ignore the price of water but think about what's the value of water to your business tied to business continuity and business growth then you can make investments in technology you can make investments in innovative partnerships that help you mitigate the risk and drive your growth and i, I often talk about uh, water with respect to fueling business growth if you've got enough liters of water and you're making beverages, then life is good. If you don't, then life is not good. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yes. And 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 moving into the the present and, and thinking to what's the state of the space right now. And when I say right now, I'm, I'm thinking of July 24th, 2024. <laughs> right now, today, what do it could change by Friday. Who knows? It could change by Friday. <laughs> it's, moving fast. it's moving fast. Certainly, we are moving faster than than ever. We we can agree on that. And and, and what do you think has been like the the main changes in 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 today conversation around water and and what what keeps you excited today about the things that are, that are happening? Boy, that's a great question. What gets me excited about the world of water? Um, I could go on about that for a while, um, which I will. Um, so <laughs> so where are things right now? For me, this is a really, really interesting time. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is that I believe innovation and partnerships will change corporate water strategy. And I won't even use the word stewardship because I really want to push the notion that it's a corporate strategy that aligns with a business strategy. So think about some of the things that you're doing right now. That's thriving because corporations are now thinking about how do they partner with a technology company uh, as part of their water stewardship replenish net positive initiative and potentially how do they make direct investments in technology companies uh, corporations are thinking about how do they uh, create partnerships between a tech company a water utility uh, and other stakeholders so the the big change for me is around innovation and partnerships. And I get really excited about it because suddenly corporations are thinking uh, that they and realizing that they have a menu of options in terms of who they work with. And historically, the early days of water stewardship, corporations went to NGOs uh, to work on you know, watershed health initiatives, which, you know, was, was groundbreaking at the time. It still continues. It's still critical. But the connectivity between stakeholders uh, has really blossomed. And so I get excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that will only accelerate over time. And again, you know, the work that you're doing is a great example of that. Uh, I get excited that, uh Corporations are engaging with entrepreneurs uh, 
you know, the ABM Dev 100 Plus Accelerator Program, I think is a really good example of how a corporation really thought differently about who they are and what they could do to have an impact beyond, you know, just looking at their water risk and water footprint. You know, and I would say going forward, um, what I am very focused on and very interested in uh, uh, being part of is corporate thinking around who they are and what they can do to solve water. And what I mean by that is not just looking at their footprint uh, across their operations and their value chain, but thinking about, okay, I'm a global company. I have a huge workforce. I have a huge supply chain. I have capital to invest. How do I engage with the workforce? How do I engage with my customer base, engage with the communities I'm in to, uh, you know, achieve SDG six and and deliver solutions. So I talk about that within the context of a handprint. So what's the handprint of a company? And I, I think the uh, technology sector is a really good example of that. And, and happy to go on and, about and, it. And, and and before moving into what are the tool that we're going to use, um, I I really want to like pick on this sense that cooperation and engagement engaging in truly thinking that they can make a dent on the problem it, yeah? uh, and that's new that's very new before it, that they yes were... yes oh. it, it right it is not a corporate social responsibility issue I, you know it it's not solely a esg issue or or csr if you want to frame it that way issue on, you know, what is a corporation doing? They're reporting it either, you know, through a, a regulatory program or a voluntary. It's really thinking about how does a company in any sector believe they can have a positive impact on solving water quantity, water quality, access issues, building healthy watersheds. And I believe the corporate world is uniquely well-suited to be a catalyst for change, uh, in, including influencing public policy and getting into things like aqua for recharge, you know, water reuse in the built environment, uh, you know, whatever it may be. So I get excited about that. And that's what I push. And, and there, you, you, you use a, a term that uh, there is the very well known term in the water space that's uh, collective action. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I, I love that term, but I sometimes fight with that term because <laughs> it is the idea of organized action, yeah? And I know that innovation is never organized. It's always a disorganized process. But, and you coined a term that I think that you did that, uh, that's catalytic communities. Can, can you give us a, it, a broader? It, okay. Sure. Um, so collective action became a very core piece of water stewardship. And it was very powerful, um, but it had, in my view, it has limitations. And uh, I, I worked, I had a colleague when I was at Deloitte and she led a, an initiative called Aligned Action. And she got me thinking about the difference between collective action where people show up and they wanna do something together but they may not be aligned. And she really pushed that you need alignment to get people to invest and commit and have an impact. And my think that thinking and that education I got, uh, got me really, really interested in catalytic communities through another friend of mine, uh, Tom Higley. And I love catalytic communities because it has, it's built in a way to have a bias for action. It challenges the status quo. Uh, it has uh, uh, one, of, one of the attributes and, and key aspects is that the catalytic community will create something new, new whether it's uh, a tool, a platform, uh, a way of working together, whatever it may be. 
so another thing that I tend to push is really rethinking collective action and getting people to move towards more of a catalytic community where everyone has a vested commercial relationship and interest that drives impact at speed and, and also is very transparent. So, I, you know, I'm always very careful with this, that I'm not advocating throwing out collective action, no. but we all need to acknowledge it has uh, not achieved the promise that we thought it would have. Mm -hmm. So either think about how to modify it or think in a different way. And, you know, I'm engaged and married to this construct of collective action and collective action includes uh unreasonable people which you know you are certainly one so right, yeah, that, yeah right. so that's kind of how i think about all this and and, and you're centering that and, and connecting these two things that we just brought up i do believe that this sense that we can make a dent in this i mean the water problem is it's a big problem yes and, and and the sense that, that we can make at that end is because we have, we are creating catalytic communities with exponential actors, and those actors are we, the technology companies. Yes, absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and and catalytics process, I, I love chemistry, are always exponential. <laughs> always, they they need to multiply themselves really fast. That's why you're putting a catalytic there. So. That's why I, I do think that the technology players, even when we sometimes might we might be misguided because we have a, you are a VC and you know VC put, push us into some weird direction sometimes. <laughs> uh, we we bring this idea that this has to move fast. We need this to move fast. So, how do you see all these technology players playing a role in the space? You're involved with many of them. Different capacities. Yeah, I. I one of, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate. So I got very involved with startups and uh, scale ups uh, a number of years ago, uh, starting with, you know, it being part of Imagine H2O and, uh, you know, what they launched, um, you know, being an advisor judge and all that. And then also, uh, I was very involved with the TNC uh, tech startup. Uh, accelerator program. And, and I got absolutely hooked on working with entrepreneurs and the excitement of that and how they think and how they build and uh, how they get market traction. So I view them as a spark, if you will, and, you know, really kind of poking at the status quo and coming in with new ideas, uh, you know, new tech, certainly, <clears throat> but also new business models. And I, I, the thing I value most about startups uh, is, is the people side of it, the team. So the right team can change the world without a doubt. So, <laughs> and, I'm looking at you, and, and I'm looking at you. Um, so yeah, I, I see startup scale-ups is absolutely critical in all of this. Um, and I, I, really do love that startups are now working directly with corporations and, and now more and more NGOs uh, and uh, the public sector utilities. So yeah, it's a really fascinating time. So something that, that, that I believe is also important there and, and I think that, that we start to bring is that everybody wants to interact with us. I mean, you, you don't get it. So, because people have preconcepts. So, some NGOs might mm -hmm. not want to interact with companies, some government might I, don't like corporate, but certain people at least open the door for us a little bit and let us pitch. Yeah. And then we can take him from there. But I, we get a shot without preconcepts. It, you get a shot at it. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, I, I so admire, you know, what you're doing with Colimo. Um, but uh, you know who you are. I mean, you are you're a driving force for change, and people get excited about that. So you know, 
that passion, enthusiasm is infectious. And we're seeing things change. Yeah, we are seeing significant change. And and moving on into, into the future, and we have a couple of questions, but I, I really wanted to, and, and this is for me the most important part of the conversation, <laughs> at, at least for me, I don't know, for the rest of the people listening, but what's what's on the book, Will? What's coming into the future? What do you think is, is next uh, for the water stewardship space? Um... So for me, from a technology perspective, digital transformation is probably the biggest trend. So mm -hmm. real-time data, uh, data analytics, uh, and of course, I would be remiss if I did not say AI. Uh, enormous potential there. So think about the digital transformation of uh, corporations. So the ability to deliver real-time data, and uh, predictive analytics remotely, you know, using satellite data, aerial data, on the ground data, will transform supply chains, hopefully in a positive way, uh, and also operations, and also connect the consumer and customer better to uh, the public sector like utilities. Um, oh, Will, sorry, to, just to. to... People don't have an idea how analog the water conversation is, even in big corporations. I mean, it's just a couple of spreadsheets and, and notes that come back and forth. It's oh, it's, it, it, it's nuts. I mean, I, you know, I, I often say, because I firmly believe it, that analog is no longer an option. You know, yeah. in, in a world where uh, there's water scarcity, water stress, poor quality, lack of access, uh, you know, health issues, you need real-time data and you need real-time data to make better uh, business decisions and decisions if you're a utility. So uh, analog doesn't work. Spreadsheets are lovely, but forget about it. That That's not going to, that, that's not a 21st century solution. Um, I believe also that uh, the world is moving towards uh, decentralized water mm -hmm. tech solutions. So right now on the infrastructure side, it, you know, it's, it's centralized, you know, the Romans would recognize our water infrastructure. You know, we extract it, we treat it and we move it around mm -hmm. and it's, you know, a big investment in money, uh, uh, you know, capital costs and O and M costs. And we now have technologies that can deliver, uh, water reuse to your home, commercial properties, neighborhood scale. Uh, that's a, a radical change um, in that there, there's a different menu out there. Uh, there is there are off grid solutions for water, uh, air moisture capture. I, you know, I'm really fascinated by the technology category. The the notion that every home could have an air moisture capture tech on their roof or backyard and have safe drinking water uh you know without the infrastructure is is really compelling exciting and a game changer uh and then also uh democratized that we will get to the point where everybody will have access not just to data but actionable information and if if i could find it if everyone had the ability to know the water quality coming out of their tap or the quality of the water, the safety of the water that they swim in, you know, that they recreate on, uh, you change public policy pretty quick. Um, yes. I, bet. I mean, really, you know, there's, there's nothing like annoyed people to change public policy uh, quickly. So, you know, digital, decentralized, democratized from a tech perspective. Um, and then couple that with innovative partnerships. I mean, you know, again, you know, the spark of entrepreneurs coupled with, you know, the uh, unique position of the corporation in engaging with investors, entrepreneurs, uh, academic institutions, public sector, uh, and civil society is, is really exciting. So uh, there's a lot going on.
And there, Will, I, I would like to like ask you a little bit about what thing you you what what role you think the the frameworks for quantifying water impacts are going to play into the future. Uh, so uh, I can correlate the relationship between the publication of VWBA and the more tailored and scalable investment in the space in the last four years from 2019 onwards. Yeah. What yeah, do you think about yeah. that? The... Yeah, I mean, volumetric benefit, you know, uh, accounting is, is important. It gets to the data part of it. It gets the transparency part of it. It touches, it, you know, it, auditing and validation is going to be critical for all that. Um, but I would also say I am hopeful that corporations start thinking about water uh, more as a business issue and less as a ESG issue or CSR issue, just a core business issue, uh, not just in the beverage sector, but you know, apparel, manufacturing, uh, retail, hospitality, uh, mining, oil and gas, of course. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to do. It's a lot of work to do. So, Will, I do have a couple of questions here. The, the um, one of the first one is what learnings can water stewardship uh, take from the carbon uh, space? Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, what, what can uh, boy, I, I, I feel like you planted that one. Um, <laughs> no, 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 nothing to do with that. <laughs> what? I want to say I'm not sure. Um, because, and I'm very biased, water is unique. Water is not carbon. Water is not fungible. Um, uh, you know, and... and now having a few minutes, I'll, I'll retract what I said uh, about nothing, uh, or I'm not sure. So I, I just want to make the point, what is fundamentally different? It's got, it's all about what is local. It's got, you know, environmental, economic, social, and spiritual dimensions that a ton of carbon does not. Having said that, what can the water sector learn from the climate sector, from climate practitioners? Boy, they nailed the communication piece of it. Like they reduced an incredibly complex issue like climate change to just, you know, sort of a, a short sound bite. And the water sector um, sort of stumbles over the communication piece. I mean, you, you know, you've heard me ramble for 30 minutes. You know, it, water professionals trip over themselves trying to explain why water is a critical issue and why people should care. If we had like a short, snappy way to talk about it, like climate change, that would be something to learn. Uh, but we will worry about that, Will, because you also saw, you, 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 we, we were able to witness a lot of growth in the carbon space and then a disaster, yeah? So, and that's because they nailed the communication piece too well. <laughs> And not, right. not the execution part as well. Yeah. So I I here believe that and I I, I trip over words and communication all the time. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yes, but I I I feel that water is a much, much more real subject that you can yes. touch and feel. So you should be careful. I mean, even when that's slow us down a little bit you should it, it, look i agree with you i mean water is tangible it's vision you know uh it's visceral it is you know people connect to water once you explain it to them very simply and i'll i'll, I'll give you a good example you know i'm part of a rowing club and mm -hmm. When I got involved in the club, I got on the board and started to talk about like what I do in my day job and why water is important. And the club has gone from, you know, I, I would say in general, not really knowing a lot about the watershed that we're in, the reservoir that we're in, the 
quality of the water, the quantity of the water, and all the issues that you and I deal with on a daily basis, um, I would say was, you know, sort of relatively new. Now they get it. And it's this incredibly personal connection. So I believe it's a good example of, you know, how do you get people to care? And how do you get people to pay attention to the things that we do professionally? Mm -hmm. And just making it tangible is the way to do it. I, I, I do think we need better language, though. Yeah, um, we need, and, and we're working on it. Uh, surely <laughs> you, you're working on it. So, Will, uh, another question is, what do you think is key things that move companies from this collective action promise that has lacked the sufficient action part, I think, to catalytic communities. What, what move one to the other? Again, we love, we, we believe collective action is important, but when, how we evolve that collective action catalytic community? Yeah, I, you know, in collective action, it's important to ensure everyone's aligned, everyone's committed. Uh, you know, since we're, you're dealing with people, then some people will care more than others. Uh, I think it's just important to not um, not build a collective action strategy that uh, plays to the lowest common denominator, if you will. And that'll sound nasty and negative, but um, look, you know, everyone's got to get in. They, you know, they've, they've got to participate in solving whatever challenges a particular watershed has. And if you've got players that just show up and don't contribute either, you know, uh, in kind uh, or financially, then uh, you're going to have a problem. I also th believe that, you know, it, what's what I think is missing mostly from collective action is an economic driver to ensure it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think any corporation wants to get engaged in a program that uh, starts off with a bang and then ends with a whimper, you know, in a year. So how do you build, you know, a par enduring par partnership uh, that has a life of its own and continues on? Uh, and I don't think that's easy to do, but I believe that that's essential going forward. Uh, and it gets back to what we talked about before. So how do you create these commercial relationships between the corporation, the tech company, uh, the public sector, you know, NGOs and, and you know, so on? The, the, there is, and an, an, uh, I think that the collective part has to be aligned with the, everybody has a win model into that collective. Oh, actually. yeah. I uh, has agree. A, I mean, the, the problem is that those business models are really hard to make. I mean, creating a business model that where everybody wins 100% are, are hard. Yeah, and they take a lot of time, a lot of money to give up. Yes, I, you know, I'm not saying any of this is easy. Uh, I, I, but I am saying that's where we need to go. And I believe we're, we're beginning to see some new thinking come to the table that, uh, you know, we have a shot to, uh, be successful. Last question to you, Will. What is holding us back? Yeah, what what do you think is creating <laughs> the And and this is again a question from the audience. But what what is holding us back? Uh, 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 people. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you know, we've we've seen the enemy, and it's us. Um, yeah. Look, it, you know, change is difficult for people. Uh, you know, the status quo. Uh, is, you know, it viewed many times as good enough. So, um, yeah, I, 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 getting people to change um, is, is difficult, um, but not impossible. And I would say that the biggest lever we can pull in the world of water is by changing public policy. If you could change public policy, you would see greater adoption of technologies and, and a greater impact so, you know, I encourage, encourage corporations to, you know, think about what's their role in, uh, you know, supporting innovation in public policy and engaging with other stakeholders that they might not typically engage with. So I believe that's what's holding us back. But on the other hand, you know, there are people out there that are a pain, 
you know, they're annoying because they don't accept the way things are. <clears throat> and we need to uh, encourage those people and, and work with them. But uh, we, but they are a stakeholder, yeah, and that's the thing with water. I mean, everybody's a stakeholder. Yes, every, have... every, everyone's a stakeholder. Yes, I, I agree with you completely, regardless of what sector you're working in. And, and it's really hard to make a way around. And there on the public policy side, I, I think that we, I, I must add that we a startup has a, a have a, a tendency not to invoke get involved in public policy. And we also can, we, we can use that ability to get a pass, a, a, a foot in the door into the public sector and collaborate. And we, we should explore, technology companies should explore that mm -hmm. much more. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, well, I mean, you do have a, a role to play in, the, in changing public policy. I mean, you show up with a good technology, a good idea, a good business model. Um, you know, if you play it right and you have a strategy, the public sector will pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if your value proposition is compelling, then, you know, you've got a decent shot at changing public policy. And I, I think we're seeing that in the, in the water reuse sector, um, which is encouraging. We, we are seeing that, too, in several watersheds. But this attention for us is that it, feel, it feels slow. Yeah, it feels like extremely oh, slow. It, and, and we are wired for speed and that, that is... <laughs> But we do see how key players in several key watersheds started with not believing us and moving to like building a coalition around the way we're thinking through the it, problem. And that's great. Yeah. It's the way to do it. Yeah, it's frustrating though. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, if we can change, uh, you know, how people view. In, you know, innovation and change, uh, then we got a shot at it. And <clears throat> again, I, I, you know, I think every tech company should be engaged in, uh, you know, changing, influencing public policy, not that it's their sole responsibility, but there's a, a touch point there that's important. Yeah, so we'll thank you very much for this conversation. I always enjoy talking with you and and, and especially uh, be bagging on your experience in the space and, and the fact that you are a a very active participant of the current conversation and the future one. Um, thank everybody for attending this water talk. And maybe will you have some final words to say? Happy to <laughs> make to you. And then it, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. I, I I really do love talking to you. And you know, this is again one of my favorite topics. Yeah. I you know a final thought. Um, you know, I'm an optimist. Um, you know, I'm not naive, but I believe that you have to have a positive view of change to get you to be uh, persistent and relentless. Uh, and that gets me up and going every day. So um, yeah, and I, I really like working with optimists. Uh, again, not being naive, but changing things. I, I have a, a phrase for that. Uh, I do believe that you are and many other players in the space professional optimists. We work <laughs> we're professional and we learn Wait. everything. But we are optimists, yeah. Uh, so higher up, I, I, I think we need t-shirts that have that on it. <laughs> I am a professional optimist. Um, I love very it. Important because the problem is big, well, it's very big and we have to have optimists, but also the knowledge to tackle it in the yes. right way. I agree with you. I like that. Okay. I, I will quote you. <laughs> please, please do. So uh, thanks, okay. Will, for this conversation. Thanks, everybody, for joining us into this Water Talk. Look, stay tuned for follow Water Talks and, and see you next time. Thanks so much. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.